Hi, I'm Christian Brindle, and welcome to the Everything Medicare Podcast. What's up, everything, Medicare Podcast Nation? This is Christian Brindle. Welcome to episode 144, wherever you are and however you may be listening. Every single week, we bring you three podcast episodes where we discuss your Medicare, your Medicaid, your Social Security, and everything that has to do with that golden age called retirement. And today, folks, I am bringing you an episode about three different types of insurance policies that I personally believe everybody should purchase and pick up. Um, And this was partially inspired by the interview I did with Galen Hendricks of um, Senior Security Benefits that was aired back on, well, Wednesday, um, this past week. Today is Saturday. Um, So if you did not listen to that episode, if you happen to miss that one, I highly encourage you to go back and check out check it out and listen to it. It was a fantastic interview. Galen is a very, very prominent person in the insurance industry. She owns a very, very large and influential insurance agency that helps a tremendous amount of people and agents alike um, in the industry regarding Medicare, life insurance, all different kinds of things. And um, she sits on the board of directors for a couple of different insurance companies. She consults for some of the largest insurance organizations in the world. And it was just an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to have her come on the show. Um, now, since that episode was an interview, it wasn't a, our regular format. And we've done plenty of interviews since this podcast began. We started doing this podcast at the end of 2018. Now, uh, we we came we came under a little bit of criticism since then. Um, it came to my attention on Tuesday, actually, um, and this was the first time I'm doing a podcast where I potentially could address it. And I've really had a conversation with myself for a second because in the past, when 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 other agents have kind of attacked me and this platform, um, and it has happened once or twice because. This podcast is a threat to any agent out there that um, isn't doing a great job taking care of their clients and their customers, and they just want them to stick to reading the the Medicare and You book and figuring out themselves and just the regular format that's been out there where there's no information out there, and anyone that puts out information is the devil. That's kind of how we've been looked at by some, although there's a huge, tremendous amount of the agent su- community that does support this podcast and kind of what we're doing here. And I really much appreciate that, but, and I'm not going to talk about this too much. I'm not going to spend a whole little time on this, but basically the criticisms were that I take too many breaks for a 20 minute show. Um, we don't talk about real information about Medicare, which, you know, this person admitted they only listened to one or two episodes. So how can you possibly know that we've done a topic about everything that you can possibly think of, about Medicare in our 144 episodes, if you include this one. Um, And if this was two years ago when I first started out, I probably would have um, attacked her. I probably would have roasted her. I'm addressing it, but I'm not attacking. I'm not roasting. You got to keep in mind and be sensitive to this. When I started this podcast, um, I came into the insurance industry very, very young. Okay. I first started working on uh, getting my insurance license when I was 19 and I got into the business when I was 20. Um, so I was, I was a baby. I sold my first insurance policy before I could legally drink. And when I first started doing this podcast, I was 25. Okay. Think back to when you were 25. If you're listening to this, probably very, very few people, if any are listening to this and age 25 or younger. When I first started doing this podcast as a 25-year-old, when someone would attack us, another agent, and I knew why, agents typically attack us because we're a threat to them, because we are pulling back the curtain on the industry, on Medicare, and just giving the power to you, the customers, the beneficiaries, the people on Medicare, 
And that kind of threatens the old way of life, if you will, for the people that want it to stay the way it is to where they don't know that we're to where you don't know anything and they hold the power. And you basically have to, you know, jump for the carrot they're dangling in front of your face. I'm not for that. I'm never going to be for that. And I'll be damned if I'm going to back down. But at the same time, today I'm 27. I've been doing this podcast for almost two years. And I've grown, I've matured, and I'm not going to give this person the satisfaction of me giving them enough attention to just bash them and roast them like I would have maybe a year or two ago, okay? But I did want to address um, the complaints, and the complaints were that I take too many breaks. We have sponsors. We have to fit them in. That's how we keep the lights on. That's how we can justify making this show profitable and bringing it to you three times a week. We're an insurance agency. We're not a radio station. We're an insurance agency. So the only way to justify keeping this podcast going and doing it as frequently as we can so that you can listen to it three times a week, week after week after week after week after week, and making sure that we're not going bankrupt as a result. I mean, don't get me wrong. We do get new clients as a result of the podcast, but it's not enough to justify the time we put into it without sponsors. And I'm not interested in doing a three hour long show for you, honey. The other thing is, you know, she says, I talk too much about my, my, my personal life. This show is as much about me and what's going on in my life as than it is about Medicare. You can't have the Everything Medicare podcast without making it a little personable. Medicare is boring as nails. It's a topic that's boring as nails, boring as a brick wall, staring at your hand, boring. And the only way that we've been able to kind of make it interesting for as many of you as we have, and the only way we've been able to get the audience we have is because I've kind of put some of my personality into it. And part of that is talking about my life and trying to see how it relates to the topic we're talking about. If I do the first of three segments on this podcast where I don't talk about the topic or maybe I talk about something else and I'm leading up to it, and you have a problem with it, if you're just casually listening, if you're not one of our audience members that's been with us for years, don't listen. Go away. If you have a problem with it, make your own damn show and do it better than me if you're capable of doing that. There's a reason why there's a lot of Medicare podcasts out there. I think there's 15 that I'm aware of. And we're number one, if not number two, on every single website and platform. So just wanted to quickly address that. I'm not going to say anything more about it. I was tempted to not say a word about it, but I wanted to say something. Because this podcast is basically about honesty, about being transparent, and basically talking to you about things that are going on about the podcast, about the Medicare world, and everything that you need to know. So let's talk about the three things that I think, three types of insurance policies that I believe that everybody should pick up. Now, this, like I said, this was heavily inspired, this episode by Galen Hendricks. Go back and listen to that episode, episode 143, if you haven't already. Um, But Galen Hendricks is somebody that helped design Aetna's cancer policy. She helped design it. So she knows a thing or two about cancer insurance, and she basically, um, and I've always been a big proponent of cancer insurance. We did an episode about it um, some time ago, and why I talked about how it was, I thought it was important. But she really kind of reminded me how important it really is. And so the first type of insurance plan I'm going to be talking about is cancer insurance. I believe that every single person on Medicare if not a very large chunk, should cons- at least at the very m- at the very least consider having a cancer policy, whether you have a Medicare supplement plan or whether you have a Medicare Advantage plan. Because like she said in the episode, and I thought what she said was very insightful, for a dollar a day, 
you can get cancer insurance that can kind of cover you where your Medicare plan won't. Even if you have a Medicare supplement plan, the prescription costs that come with being on cancer could be great. And your Part D drug plan has its limitations. You could pay five to $10,000 out of your pocket in cancer drugs that aren't covered by your Medicare supplement. And especially if you're on a Medicare Advantage plan, you have max out of pockets. It might not be very high depending on where you're listening to this from. You might be in Florida and might have a $3,000 max out of pocket or a $4,000 max out of pocket. But that in combination with the pr potential prescription costs, it's worth it to pay a dollar a day to have the cancer coverage to kind of fill in those gaps. So I agree with her completely. That is the first one on what I, on what I think everybody should pick up. And I'll talk about that more after I take a break and pay the bills and keep the lights on and hear from this week's sponsor. In segment two, I'll disclose the other two types of plans that I think everybody should consider having at least a little bit. And I'll talk more about the cancer coverage. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks so much for sticking with me through that break. Let's talk about the three different types of plans that I think everyone should at the very least consider, if not have. The first one, I already kind of spoiled it. And if you heard the episode, the interview that I did with Galen Hendricks on Wednesday, episode 143, then you probably already knew that I was going to say cancer insurance is the number one. Um, I think it's very underrated. I don't think it gets talked about enough, but I think it's becoming more mainstream. And I think it's very, very um, easy to wrap your head around it, okay? Um, one out of four people will get some kind of cancer in their lifetime. That is not something that we want to think about. That's not something that I want to think about. There's a 25% chance that I'll get cancer of some kind. I don't want to think about that. But the, the difficult part about insurance and the insurance industry in general is sometimes you have to think about where you're exposed. And even if you have a Medicare supplement plan, you are exposed somewhat because of the potential large prescription costs that come with it. The donut hole, that's not the donut hole anymore, the coverage gap, can put you into very, very large out-of-pocket potential risks on some of these tier five cancer medications. So cancer policy can help with that. I think what Galen Hendricks said was very, very um, insightful, and I agree with her completely. You don't need 50, 60, $100,000 of it. All you need is 10,000, 15,000, maybe 20,000, maybe not even that much. I advise that people consider picking up a cancer policy because I don't think you'll be sorry you had that protection. And if you happen to be in the three-fourths of people that don't get cancer at some point, the worst thing that happened is you paid out adult, you know, 20, 30, 40 bucks a month in premium for a cancer policy for that kind of protection. I pay more than that in dental insurance premiums. No, not everybody can afford premiums of that kind, and I understand. But I think it's a very, very... Um, good thing to have and just something to think about. The other two types of policies that I think are pretty important that I don't think as many people get. The first one I think a lot of people a lot a lot more people get than they got 10, 15, maybe even 25 years ago. And that's life insurance. Especially if you have a family. I I did an episode where I discussed my own life insurance and kind of the adjustments I made after the enrollment period. I went from a $100,000 term policy to a million dollar term policy because I just felt like the 100,000 wasn't enough protection for my wife and my and my daughter now that I have a daughter. But if I was single and I was alone and would I need it? Probably not. So I guess you couldn't really put it in this list in terms of not everybody needs it, but I think everyone should consider it, especially if you have a family. Some type of life insurance. Go back and listen to that episode if you kind of want to know my life insurance process. Don't know the episode off the top of my head, but it's it's called something along the lines of Christian's um, life insurance strategy or something like that. The third kind, and I kind of want to spend a little bit of time talking about this, is either long-term care insurance or short-term care insurance. Let me explain. 
Now, I lean toward more towards short-term care personally than I do long-term care. I was talking to someone on the phone this morning that was inquiring about this, and they're highly considering it after we talked, and I think it's a very valid thing to consider. Long-term care insurance is expensive. We all know this, especially if you pick it up for the first time when you're on Medicare, when you're over the age of 65. There are so many health questions they put you under a microscope in terms of underwriting, and unless you're relatively healthy, it's kind of difficult to get. Now, there's, of course, with everything, there's some companies that are easy to get with, some companies that aren't. My point is, not only is it hard to get, let's say you could get anyone you want, it's expensive. It's based on the age you pick it up at. So you're probably looking at 200 bucks a month, anywhere between that and 400 bucks a month, depending on how good of coverage you want. And with long-term care insurance, it's going to cover you in an assisted living facility, a nursing home something along those lines. They call those long-term care facilities and it will cover you for anywhere between probably two years to five years, depending on what you want. The reason why I'm kind of a little bit more of a proponent to short-term care insurance is this. Did you know that 60% of people that go into a care facility don't stay longer than a year? 60%? So the majority? That's a real statistic. Google it. Look it up. So what short-term care insurance does is it covers you for up to a year. It could be less depending on what you want. But I usually recommend just taking the whole year. Why wouldn't you want something like that? You can typically get a very good short-term care insurance plan depending on your age and depending on your state and your market, of course, but you probably can get one for anywhere between 30 bucks a month and 50 bucks a month. Wow, isn't that worth it? Is that not worth it? Because you know how expensive long-term care facilities can be. A lot of it depends on where you live, where, you know, the environment, the neighborhood, the type of facility, how good the facility is, how much care they do actually provide. Some facilities do more than others. But you're probably looking at very much, in a lot of cases, at least three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month. Some are probably as high as eight to ten thousand dollars a month. For all I know, there's probably some that are more. That's crippling to a lot of people. And if you didn't have to worry about that for at least the first year, wouldn't that take a load off your mind? Just something to think about. I will have more to say about this after we take a break. Hear from our sponsor. I'll be back in segment three. Going to give you my final thoughts and wrap this puppy up. Don't go anywhere. Thank you so much for sticking with me, folks, and welcome to segment three of three. Final thoughts on what I talked about at the first um, segment of this episode. A lot of people that I'm close to and just people in general, you know, our, our, our communities and things like that told me that I just shouldn't even address the person that I addressed at the beginning of the episode. And I guess I have some kind of insecurities, right? I guess I don't do very well with um, criticism, especially when I know that it's coming from someone that's just criticizing me because I'm a threat to them just trying to bash me for that reason. And we've had that before. Although, as I grow older, I get more comfortable in my own skin. And I am comfortable enough in my own skin to kind of admit that I am not a perfect human being. But are any of you listening are a perfect human being? Of course, I mean, I guess I'm, I have some insecurities that kind of makes me want to you know, fire back at that person, you know, but I'm getting better at it. And if this had happened a couple years ago, I probably would have roasted her. I probably would have lit her on fire for the whole world to see, but I don't want to be that type of person. I know the more well-known I get, the more well-known my company gets, and the more well-known this podcast gets, the more people are going to pop up out of the woodworks that have bad things to say about me, the show, the content, whatever, my company, because for every hundred person that appreciates your work, 
no matter what it is, there's probably going to be about two or three people that hate what you do. And if there's a thousand people that love what you do, there's probably going to be 20 or 30 people that hate what you do. And sometimes the negative can outshine the positive. And I just really appreciate all of you for sticking with us um, over the years, listening week after week, and you know, being with me on my journey. This podcast is also a journey of the evolution of me as I go along, as someone that's not a perfect individual, as somebody that started out as a very, very young man that did not know exactly who he was. I think I know who I am today. I think I know who knew who I was when I started this podcast. But I can't say that I was on the exact same level when I started than I am today. I feel very, very secure, very, very comfortable today. But I'm an imperfect human being like us all. And I'm working on things. And I strive to be better. But I appreciate you, the audience, kind of letting me go off on different topics and journeys and just kind of sticking with us and being interested in what I have to say. Because there's not a whole lot of people that can just freely talk the way we talk, the way we present information and, you know, capture somebody's interest like this podcast has. So back to the topic in hand, I believe that out of everything we've talked about, the thing, the topic that does not get enough attention is the short-term care insurance. Long-term care is fine. I get it. But if it was me, I'd rather get a short-term care plan because it's easier to get, number one. It's so much cheaper, number two. And chances are you won't need more than a year, as much as I hate to say it. Don't get me wrong. I've gone, I've gone to plenty of these long-term care facilities where the there's a resident there that's been there for 15 years or 20 years or something like that. Or you know, there's a couple of those or something like that. But is that the majority? Probably not. Probably not. I would say it's pretty likely that 60, 70% of the people that live there have been there yes, less than a year. For those of you who don't know, before I got in the insurance industry, when I was a teenager, I worked in an assisted living facility for three years. I did all kinds of work there. Worked in the kitchen, did night security. I um, worked in the front desk, the concierge service desk. I helped with activities, played card games with them. They even asked me to do a stand-up comedy show, which, God, I mean, who knew? Uh, who knew? I was kind of dabbling in stand-up comedy back at the time, and I, obviously I wasn't very good because look at what I'm doing today. But um, my point is, when I was working there, it was a revolving door. There were some people that were there day after day, year after year, and they're still there today because I still keep in touch with the facility. They had me come in and do seminars for them and that kind of stuff um, about Medicare and things like that because I'm still very closely connected with the facility. I have friends up and down there, both residents and employees. But I believe that short-term care is incredibly important. You can get it for cheap depending on your age. I mean, it's of course, all, all most insurance policies are more depend the older you get, especially in the health insurance world and life insurance world. So take it with a grain of salt, but it's typically much more affordable than long-term care insurance, in my personal opinion. I'll probably get some, some backlash on that, but I don't care. That's my opinion. I think it's pretty obvious that that is fact. So to, to reiterate, cancer policies, definitely. I didn't want to go into too much detail about that because I, that's, that was talked about in length with the interview I did with Galen on Wednesday. Um, number two, life insurance. We've done several episodes about life insurance. Didn't want to talk about that too much. But the third one, I think, is some kind of long-term, short-term care plan. I'd, I'd lean towards short-term care. Now, we've done an episode in the past about long-term care, but one episode, I thought it was important to reiterate. And those are three policies. Of course, you need health insurance. Of course, you need car insurance. Obviously, I'm not saying these are the only three policies that, have, that people should have. But what I am saying is I think there are three policies that everyone should highly consider having. And I don't think you're in such a bad spot if you elect to take all three. Thanks so much for listening, folks. If you got something positive out of this episode, please do me a favor. 
drop us a five-star review on whatever platform you might be listening to us on. It helps us reach more people just like you who need to hear this message, who are just lost and confused and not sure what to do. Um, and keep in mind that my company is a full-on Medicare specialized insurance agency. If you would like to talk about anything that we ever talk about on the podcast, if you'd like to compare what you have, our office number is 801-255-5340, 801-255-5340, or you're welcome to shoot me an email at christianb at xmission.com, christianb at xmission.com. We're currently licensed in the states of Utah, Idaho, Oregon, Colorado, Texas, South Carolina, and Florida. I think I got them all. Utah, Idaho, Oregon, Colorado, Texas, South Carolina, and Florida. But stay tuned. We're working on California. Thanks so much for listening, folks. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. Thanks for spending some time with me. And I'll be back on Monday. Take care now.